Does this place have gods? Gods? What are these gods? Beans are great power who meddle in the daily affairs of mortals, demand worship, wreak havoc, whatever they pass. Nah, we got immortals here. What are these immortals? Beans are great power who meddle in the daily affairs of mortals and wreak havoc whenever they pass. But they only occasionally demand worship. Ah, I feel much more secure now. That little exchange in a small sidebar towards the back of the Karamikos Kingdom of Adventure book was one of the best examples of world building in D&D. It's two men, one of which is a planar traveler, having a drink at the in-between world somewhere in Mistara. We don't know anything about either of the men. They're never mentioned again, but they define the differences between their settings. Amando comes from a setting with gods, while Rehando is native to Mistara. When they start talking about religion, both men are confused for what passes for a deity in the other's world. In most D&D settings, gods are omnipresent. Everybody knows who they are and what they are. But Rehando has no concept of what they are. With that one line, you've established a major aspect of Mastar that separates it from the rest of D&D. Every setting needs to be different. It needs to have things that it and only it can claim. Something that a visitor would be utterly astonished to learn about. Or horrified. I'm Mr. Welch, and today we're ruminating on the importance of settings. First, I know what you're thinking. And yes, I'm taken. I know what you're thinking now. This video is inspired by the Dragonlance UA and the changes that are being made. When you think of Dragonlance, of course the first thing that springs to mind is Goldmoon Sans Pants. However, as she is now firmly in the Pro Trousers camp, you have to settle for Kinder. Yes, the same Kinder that made every party's life a living hell 30 years ago. But it's also the same Kinder that helped make Dragonlance a distinct setting that stood out from Mastara, Forgotten Realms, and Greyhawk, the only other settings that officially existed at the time. Everything about Dragonlance was slightly different. Gully Dwarves took away the pride and elegance that defined dwarves. Tinker Gnomes became the mad scientists that now dominate the genre. Numerous races just didn't exist. There were no orcs or half-orcs by extension. Dragonlance changed everything we knew about D&D. For the first time, a setting dared to tell the players no, they couldn't play something. The result was the game world that launched D&D into the mainstream. I'm not kidding about its success, and I'm not exaggerating either. For a while in the late 80s and a good chunk of the early 90s, everything was Dragonlance. The book showed people that the game wasn't the occult abomination too many critics had made bank spreading hysteria around. Yeah, the books were stock fantasy compared to a whole host of other fantasy books out there, but the setting for D&D players was new and challenging. Rather than trying to fit everything from both monster manuals and the Fiend Folio into Dragonlance, the designers just cherry-picked the monsters that fit and excluded the ones that didn't. But now D&D is going in the exact opposite direction. Everything has to be in everything. Kinder are now touched by the Feywild, a concept completely alien to the original Kren. They are scattered across the multiverse, meaning you aren't free of them no matter where you go. Draconians were a terrifying new monster to fight. Gnolls, no matter how crazy they get, don't explode when you kill them, or turn to stone, or dissolve into acid. But according to Fizzbands, now they're just another monster found across the multiverse. Nothing unique about them. And uniqueness is the key. Nobody wants to run around in stock fantasy setting number five. That's an inherent danger to kitchen sink settings. If you include everything, you look like every other kitchen sink setting out there. When everything is allowed, nothing stands out. I've talked about it before and I'll harp on it again. The more you add, the more you have to remember. If somebody wants to play a race common in the Arctic and you allow it and you make their people a major part of the background, you will run into a conflict if another player is doing the exact same thing with a character from an arid desert and wants his family to be nearby. Lines in your setting have to be drawn somewhere or it's going to get real blurry. You might be tempted to add various races that are popular in other settings to yours. Let me warn you, don't do it. D&D settings are rarely capable of cross-pollinating. Forgotten Realms just took everything about their setting from Greyhawk and lost a huge part of Greyhawk's charm. Faerun is all about world-shattering events in a setting where every possible creature can be found walking down the street. Greyhawk consists of a bunch of ethnically homogenous nations constantly on the brink of war with each other. The common folk just want to live their lives in peace while the kings and queens play deadly politics. Forgotten Realms might have more diversity in terms of races, but it's also known as the place with the apocalypse of the week. And it really doesn't help that all the focus has been on the Sword Coast. The reason why I'm talking about taking the popular race de jour is usually when a race is getting a lot of attention, it's something new and innovative that works well in its setting. Tieflings in Planescape had this mysterious background. Every one of them had a different appearance, and they all had little else in common except for their fiendish taint. Then they jumped to other settings and are now mostly shirtless edgelords that all look like Lud from Nightbreed, mostly known for complaining to the other tieflings that make up the rest of the party how downtrodden they are. This isn't new. Kinder were all the rage before they became despised from overuse. Drow are considered jokes by many players because of overexposure. Familiarity breeds contempt, and playable races are no exception. 
The reason is the law of diminishing returns. Somebody comes up with something new, and people like it because it's a new story or an adventure they haven't seen before. Then people want more, but there might not be another story in that setting to be told. Reusing the character can lead it to be placed in a series of stories of declining quality because the story's already been told. Quick, what's your favorite part seven of a movie series? Stories are designed to be wrapped up, or else you get rehashed tripe or padded nonsense. Give you an example of what I ran across in a random conversation about the new Craven the Hunter show. There was absolutely zero hype for it on various fan boards. This came as a surprise, because I remember Craven from the last Hunt storyline. In short, he finally defeats Spider-Man, leaves him for dead, puts on a Spider-Man costume, runs around being the fake Spider-Man, thinking he's taken all of Spider-Man's powers. Spidey obviously returns, confronts Craven, and Craven refuses to fight him because he's already beaten Spider-Man. He knows he can beat Spider-Man. He doesn't have to prove himself to anyone. Spider-Man leaves, and Craven, having accomplished everything he wanted in life, blows his brains out with a rifle. To say this shocked readers would be an understatement. So I tell this to one of the people wondering why they're even doing Craven, and the guy tells me that the story sounds amazing and they should have left it there. Instead, they brought Craven back to life because comic book, and he devolved into a crazy Spider-Man hunting villain who was at best mid-tier, and was used mainly as a chump for Spidey to beat up while they looked for another major villain storyline. The Craven story was told. It was over. It couldn't get any better. It never has. And they ruined it. Overuse of a race or a character kills what made it special. Nobody gasped when somehow Palpatine returned. Everybody eye rolled, sure, but nobody gasped. That brings me on how to populate a setting. Step one, put on your best Empress Nympho costume. Step two, grab a copy of the Monster Manual. Step three, decide yes or no if you want each creature in your game. You can pass by some because regular animals are going to be a staple of almost any game unless you're doing Dark Sun or Planescape. You can skip by entire groups if they don't fit your theme. Do you want dinosaurs? Demons? Githyanki? Lycanthropes? Quebecois? Do they fit your theme? Are you going to have a Lost World vibe? Are your players going on an interstellar voyage? Do your players speak French? If it doesn't fit your setting, then just go no and turn the page. Make sure you have a theme in mind before you even start working on your setting. Look at the classic 2nd edition setting specific monster compendiums for examples of how to handle populating your world with bad guys. Ravenloft was all about horror, so their monsters were pretty much the stuff of nightmares. Things like vampire kinders, red widows, and pyre elementals. Especially pyre elementals. Nothing in that world could even be considered remotely lighthearted. Mastara's status as effectively Fantasy Australia gave it a lot of weird monsters that confirmed its status as the off-kilter setting. Dark Sun's book had some of the deadliest monsters in D&D history. Planescape was obviously all extraplanar creatures. You had themes of horror, exploration, survival, and otherworldly adventure. Sure, you could come across a puka that somehow found its way into the mists, but it was a better fit in the world where every new land was something never seen before. The fewer creatures you add, the more restrictive your setting will be, but the more focused it will be at the same time. This means more detail you can pour into each individual race. Dragonlance was able to fill in the cultures of the Kinder, the Gully Dwarfs, Tinker Gnomes, every type of elf, and the Draconians in just a few books, because the books weren't crowded with random races that appeared with little reason. There were other races like Hobgoblins, Ogres, and Goblins, but they weren't completely fleshed out until they needed to be. Don't be afraid to go off formula when it comes to race. 5th edition is rightly criticized for presenting the Monster Manual from a Forgotten Realms point of view, even when the monsters in other settings were radically different. Knowles and Faerun are demonic spawn with no free will that kill everything in their path with no society except slaughter. In Mastara, they're the slightly kooky shock troops looking for leadership after their creators pissed off the immortals and got noped into existence. Good luck getting those two backgrounds to overlap. Minotaurs and Kren are noble sailors instead of just bloodthirsty monsters. Eberron managed to actually make the drow interesting again after decades of Drizzt clones and people whining about the, what the drow are supposed to represent in real life. I can tell you what they represent in real life. They represent players that wanted to play their super special unique spotlight hog with a 20 page background and a campaign based around their character only to be shocked when they found out half the damn party was made up of drow characters run out of their evil society and looking for an acceptance in a world that was not their own. Meanwhile, my first edition thief is standing outside the pawn shop and keep on the borderlands, fogging up the window trying to figure out how to steal the jeweled scabbard worth 600 gold pieces, with all the guards on the walls looking at him with their crossbows ready. But no, go ahead and brood some more while the rest of the party just wants to go stab things because we're tired of schoolwork. It's Friday night and nobody wants to support the football team because we've won five games in three seasons, which in Texas means the coach only has two options. Get fired or commit seppuku. Where was I? Oh yeah, setting building. One part of setting building that not many people take into consideration is that of language. I'm not talking about speaking elf, dwarf, or goblin. 
I'm talking about regional and national languages between the various countries you're going to visit. Sure, there's going to be a lingua franca in the form of the common language, but that's just to avoid the embarrassing Twilight 2000 moment when the entire party realizes nobody speaks Polish and you're standing in the remains of war-torn Krakow. The common tongue can change from region to region. In Mastara, you've got Thaetian common, Alphatian common, Hollow World has its own common because Thaetis didn't exist when half of them got stuck there. The Undersea has its own common, and you would assume the other continents have their own version of the common tongue. If you need to create a common tongue, take the most popular language in the area and assume that people can speak it at a rudimentary level. You might be able to order food in Latin, but you're not going to pass for a fluent speaker at all. But you need other languages to make your world feel real. A good example is The Thirteenth Warrior. Not where he learns Norse at an accelerated pace because the film's editing made about three months of travel look like a couple of days. But when he meets the Vikings for the first time and finds out that they don't speak Arabic or Greek, but one of them knows Latin. Work scenes like that into your game. Maybe they're at an isolated village and nobody speaks the common tongue, so you'll have to try and communicate in the local tongue. Or find a villager that speaks the language of the nation next door, so you can have the same phrase being translated from your players to the translator, then to the old lady that you need the info from, and then repeat the process back. If your players find books in other countries, there's no reason they should be written in anything other than the local dialect. It adds to the roleplay opportunities, especially when there's a chance of miscommunication or misunderstanding. The little details make or break your setting. Things like coins from one nation not being accepted into another. Want to blow some minds? Make heavy use of electrum or platinum as a currency. Or have an advanced society not use coins at all. One nation could hoard gold, and they use electrum as a primary currency instead. If you go this route, just double the price of everything in the book that costs gold pieces, and if the players insist on paying in gold, that makes them highly suspicious in the eyes of the law. A dwarven nation that's rich in platinum could make that coin the most common, or they have so much of it that the value is diminished in their borders. Steel from Dragonlance, where gold wasn't considered that valuable because of the softness, so steel became the coin of the realm. Derekin is replacing coins with paper money so they can control the value of the currency. They've gone so far as to remove out-of-circulation currency, even ones from dead nations or other nations to control the amount of precious metals in the marketplace. If nothing else, it gives your players a reason to go to the money exchange as soon as they cross the border. Don't restrict your stereotypes to entire nations. Most nations have internal divisions in their culture that, while not obvious to outsiders, are a matter of cultural pride to them. Even small nations like Britain can have different cultures based on the neighborhoods of the same cities. You're not going to confuse someone with a Cockney accent from East London with a Geordie from Tyneside, despite the two areas being less than 300 miles away. For reference, that's a little bit further than the distance between Houston and Dallas. There's going to be differences in culture between city dwellers and farmers, and the larger the cities, the more differences in culture you're going to find. Some can be like slight changes like different pronunciations. While you can have older customs still being practiced in remote areas that, while not observed in cities, might be a source of pride and even a tourist event for the urban neighbors. Few people in Njoldra and Kielland might know how to do the traditional goblin stomping frug anymore, but they might go attend the annual goblin stomping frug festival a few miles away in Lake Town. The party might arrive in time to watch people leave for the festival. That's when you cue the adventure hook. Settings are important. They frame possible stories and tell tales that can lead from one adventure to the next. They connect the adventures and let players immerse themselves into worlds that they want to be part of. Keep those settings unique as it preserves them. It keeps them from turning into watered-down vanilla. I had to get that off my chest. I'm also trying out my new software, so I hope you like it. But until next time... Yes. No, 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 yes. No, 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 yes. No, no, yes. No, 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 yes. No, 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 yes. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Yes!